since 2003, creating future leaders for Nepal, connecting young leaders all over the world, making Nepal proud globally. Today's Youth Asia, GPO 8975, EPC 5478, Kathmandu, Nepal. Are there any special programs for the development of women and girls in a developing country like Nepal? You said on um, uh, empowering women or training. Yes, a lot, because you've got so many international organizations here. You've also got a lot of homegrown talent here. Um, the women's um, movement here was very strong in the initial push for peace. I mean, there's an interesting thing here, and I have a question for you that you might be able to answer, because nobody so far has answered it for me. The women in Nepal, the Nepalese women, were right in the forefront, the women's movements here, in pushing for peace. But the minute that the peace process started, which was formal, etc., they weren't there at all. They, they, you know, they were just excluded, and they had to fight to have just one or two women at the formal peace tables. And we see that over and over. It's not just in Nepal. We've seen it with the Middle East talks. Hardly any women there, and yet this 1325 resolution exists. Uh, we saw it you know, in, in country after country. So there is a lot going on. Uh, there are many women leaders here. There tends to be at the moment a bit of a division between the men and women in Kathmandu because you're in a way the privileged lot because you speak English, many of you. Um, you have access to all the international community um, and various um, privileges. Even those who fled to Kathmandu during the conflict are having opportunities now that sisters and brothers out in the countryside may not have. Um, but um, one of the big questions and big challenges I think to all of you is how can you come up with ways, and it might be using new technology, it might be other imaginative ways, of linking much more the, the communities out there in the villages, district, and here, so that it's an equal two-way conversation. There are a lot of good people in Kathmandu who are trying to do good things. But people out there don't just want good things done to them. They want to be part of it. They want their um, economy to be, they, they want to be earning enough to eat and not be worried sick every day about have they got enough clean water. Um, all the basics of life, which is part of a peace process, a stabilizing country. Because otherwise, um, there's going to be serious problems, I think. Does that answer your question, or do you want to go deeper? Um, I don't know how long you're going to be here. In uh, here? In, in Nepal. Uh, for two months. Um, I strongly recommend you try and find, don't go out on your own because you won't have an entry into, populate, you know, into the community. Um, I strongly recommend you try and find a way of getting taken out to listen and meet people outside Kathmandu if you haven't already. Have you already? Well, women in the village were uneducated and they really didn't have any voice um, because of a very different cultural background. So what I realized working there was that um, Giving them education is equally important, um, but also we should give them economic stability. For the empowerment of women, uh, education and economic stability should go hands in hand. Yes, I mean, that every, I mean a lot of the livelihood um, workshops are going hand in hand with a lot of the empowerment rights. I mean, whether it's groups like Women's Human Rights, which is the single women's organization for widows and single women here, they're doing empowerment, 1325, and livelihoods, care at the same, and most of the international organizations are, are addressing that. I mean, I agree. It's a, there is something that I, I noticed, though, is they tend, and this came from the women themselves in the local villages. Um, when it comes to livelihoods, the international community and other groups tend to assume that because somebody hasn't had a formal education, they haven't got potential. So they tend to be offered um, hairdressing and sewing, which are very good um, professions, nothing wrong with it. But they said, some of the women in one of the villages said to me, you know, we know that women can be pilots. We know that women use computers. We can do anything. We're now in power. We can do anything. But all we need is you to train us to do it. Um, and I think uh, computer skills, I know that a lot of places haven't got electricity, but um, things will, you know, you've got access to women's centers and so on. Computer skills, repairing motorbikes, um, driving. I mean, there's so many skills that anyone has. We should stop talking about them 
and they and look around and say well, what would we want to do and what opportunities would we like and how can we help people get them. Unfortunately today rape is used as one of the most socially destructive weapons of war. I was wondering if you believe uh, laws such as Resolution 1325 can change this or if the change is going to have to come organically through the societies themselves? That's probably the toughest question um, because there's always been rape in war, we know that. But we are all much more aware of it now um, and it is being used systematically and it's along with other ways of intimidating the community. Often rape in war is used to humiliate the men as much as the women because the men feel they couldn't protect their family members. Um, and when I'm doing workshops, there's a, um, a statement I sometimes give and ask people to discuss it. Why is it that a man who's been wounded in war is considered a hero, but a woman who's been raped in war at the very least is considered an embarrassment or a shame to her community? And one of the good things about <clears throat> some of the work I've just been looking at is that women are standing up and saying, yeah, I experienced uh, nasty things in the war and I'm getting on, you know, and, and actually coming out, if I can put it in Western terms, coming out um, and standing up on it. As to prevention, um, there's a lot of discussion going on about how you prevent these things. I think, do think raising awareness that it's not socially acceptable, um, it's not a joke, it's not a funny cartoon or anything like that. Um, it's not... Um, I think that in Egypt, I think, uh, in India, I think they call it teasing, or what, what's the phrase that's, what? Eve teasing. It's not funny, actually. It's a form of bullying. Um, it's rather pathetic, in a way. Um, but these things happen. And I do think also the fact that now, with the new resolutions, which are stronger than 1325 on that particular issue, it says it's not just the perpetrator who can be accused of a war crime, but the military commander, of the perpetrator or the political leader of the perpetrator. I think if we start at least to show that you can't get away with it, you know, you're never going to get every, everybody in the net, but even if we had to start bringing one or two to court, um, and nobody even recognized rape as a war crime until the tribunal of former Yugoslavia and the first one or two people were, were, were um, prosecuted then. But it's a, a tough issue, it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, there are other forms of abuse that sometimes, there are some um, rituals here that are very cruel to women too, like uh, under Chalpadi, women uh, who've just given birth being in the cow shed for 10 days. There's some very nice traditions here, wonderful traditions, but I think people have to take an honest look at what the traditions and the attitudes that need to change. But it's, it's a big question. And it's not a question for women, it's a question for men. I'd like to see, you know, it is a men and, we're talking about men and women, what sort of society do we want? So it's you guys that um, should be asked, thinking about what are the answers, how do we handle it? Um, men, there's a number of men's networks now look, working on these issues. It started in Canada, others in Sweden. Um, so I, I would put it back as a man's responsibility to think about these issues a lot more. Because not all men are rapists by any means, and it brings all men a bad reputation. How badly is the 10 years of civil war and ongoing chaos in Nepal hampering the already bad situation of women and children in Nepal? Um, well, it's, it's an interesting question you've asked about how has the war had a negative effect on women. The w war is a nasty thing. I mean, I don't have to tell anyone in Nepal war, war is a horrid thing. However, um, often it's after the war and during the war, different opportunities open up. And what, what we've seen here... Uh, particularly for women and roles of women and men. What we've seen here in Nepal is, for example, when men were off um, in the hills or fighting or whatever, women took over running farms, plowing, um, running local communities like community leaders. Um, the women, some were women were combatants on both sides. I don't know if any of you have seen that movie, Sorry Soldiers. If not, I recommend it to you the lives of women on both sides during the conflict. It's a documentary, a Nepali documentary, very good film. Um, so also what it's done is opened up women's and men's awareness of women's human rights here. A lot of this stuff would not have been going on. So oddly enough, although there's been some really damaged lives here, and I, I've met uh, many men and women who ha had a terrible time, it's also opened up possibilities. Um, and so it's up to you whether you take them or not.
With this, we've come to the end of today's show. I'd like to thank Ms. Leslie Abdallah for being with us and sharing her thoughts and insights. We look forward for your feedback. Our email address is youthtya at the rate gmail.com. Our mailing address is youth TV show GPO 8975 EPC 5478 Kathmandu. Thank you for being with us. We hope to see you next week at the same time. Have a nice week. Namaste.